Captain, this is one of the most exciting things for me as an aviator. I mean, I've seen it on satellite, I've seen it on pictures, and I'm so excited to be here and be able to see what's in the back lot. I know you call it the flight line, but to me, this is the little secret bat lot that I've been so excited to come look at and see. But I want to first ask you, I mean, as we're walking in here, because I know, you know, during the weeks and when the Blue Angels are training, I mean, what do we have here before we get to a lot of these points? Yeah, well, some people call it uh, the flight line. You call it the back lot. I call it the North 40 because okay. it's about 40 acres where we've housed airplanes that we've collected over time. And it's also where we host our Blue Angel Air Show practices, which is twice a week from March to November, six months out of the year. Okay, awesome. So before we go in there, I just noticed this F-4. Tell me this about F-4, this. it's a fascinating story. This airplane is actually does not belong to the National Naval Aviation Museum. It's on loan from the United States Air Force to the city of Pensacola because the Navy's, excuse me, the Air Force's first African-American four-star general was a guy named General Chappie James, F-4 pilot, who is a native of Pensacola. And the new Three Mile Bridge, which connects Pensacola proper and Gulf Breeze and Pensacola Beach, is being renamed from Three Mile Bridge to the General Chappie James Memorial Bridge. And this airplane will go on display wow. at the North Landing to the formerly known Three Mile Bridge, now General Chappie James Bridge. So we're very, very proud because it represents a wonderful, rich heritage here in Pensacola, which is the cradle of naval aviation, as we've talked about. Yeah before. Always been a, an awesome aircraft. Great lines to it. I've always loved the F-4 Phantom. Yeah. Um, but so uh, how long has it been here? It uh, arrived from the Air Force earlier this year. Uh, the Chappie James Memorial Foundation paid to have it repainted and restored and we've been hosting it for them here. We've also used it as a display during the Blue Angel end of season air show in November we hauled it down to the main display area so we could tell that wonderful story to the hundreds of thousands of people that came for the Blues end of season. Okay. And then as we're entering here, and of course this becomes open to the public like you talked about, what's under this first tent though here? This is a collection of airplanes. What you see in the near ground is a tension membrane uh, structure, 90 by 180. There's a sister to that, the one that says home of the Blue Angels is the sister structure and we use it to house airplanes that we don't have room for in the hangar but we want to get them out of the harsh sun of the northwest florida and these airplanes are underneath the tension membrane right now because we're making there goes the blues You know, there are not a lot of competitive advantages in the museum world, the aviation museum world, but being the home of the Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron yeah, is one cool. of them. The flight line will put, over the course of a season, 140, 150,000 people on the flight line over 30 some odd shows. But back to your question, we have airplanes that are that we don't have yet room to display, but we have okay. future plans for. The Hornet that you see in the far ground is actually a MiG killer Hornet. It flew day one of Desert Storm by Lieutenant Nick Mongillo. He and his wingman, Mark Fox, both shot down MiG-21s, Iraqi MiG-21s, day one of Desert Storm, right. 17 January 1991. We rescued that airplane from the, the Naval Depot in San Diego where it had been significantly cannibalized and we've put put it back together almost completely, it still needs a paint job. Yeah, so we just did a full episode on E3 TV, you know, oh, about, with about his wingman. With, yeah, uh, about Mark Fox's jet, which is currently yeah. fully restored in Hangar Bay 1. It sits next to the Tomcat yeah. that you're so talking about now. Rain did that whole feature on that one, or yep. the one that's in there. So right. make sure everybody checks that out. So before we go check that out, Mm -hmm. And I know some really cool stuff down there we're going to show people here in a minute. Sure. I want to take a right, and this is exciting me, and go around and start to talk about some of these aircraft. This is what I was looking forward to seeing is uh, a lot of these. Can we, can we walk around and sure, take a look at sure. these? Sure, and we'll walk up this row first. Okay. Our, our Super Connie here, Connie. you probably know more about this airplane than I do, but we've had it for a while. 
and it was used by Weather Reconnaissance Squadron 4 to provide to call sign Brenda um, as they did meteorological surveys from altitude. So what is that pod? That's a that's a rate they're both radars. They're enclosed radars. Wow. What a difference from back then to yeah. what we have today. Yeah. So now all these aircraft here are I mean obviously the the people the public come out and walk and get to see these or are they getting they ready do. to get restored? Again, as uh, you see the rope lines here, which we don't have installed because the Blues have finished their season, but twice a week on Tuesdays and Wednesdays when the Blues practice every morning, we open our flight line an hour before takeoff and people will stream out here. I've seen as many as 8,500 people on our flight line. We average about 3,000 a show during good times. Uh, so it's like hosting a college football game twice a week for six months out of the year. And these folks, as they come out, will get a chance to see these airplanes. Also, we will have tours out here. We will bring folks out here in large golf carts. And and we have docents that will tell the story of these various so, airplanes. No, we haven't gone into restoration hangars no. yet, but are, will some of these end up in some, there? And, 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 and that's an actual, a lot of people say, hey, Sterling, why in the world do you have 50 some odd airplanes on this flight line? Well, a couple of dates. Naval Aviation started in 1911. This museum was founded in 1963. We've been on site here since 1975, but from 1911 to 1963 is 52 years. So essentially, Naval Aviation had a 52 year jump on my three predecessors, and they collected airplanes with a what I'll call a hope strategy, that we'd someday be able to restore it. We've been able to restore some, some we've loaned to other, um, other entities, others we will try to restore, and some we've just uh, flat out had to scrap. But it's, it's a challenge for us to, to keep these airplanes in working condition. In addition to airplanes, we also have uh, stern plates. You see USS Independence, USS Constellation, that's all that remains of those two great aircraft carriers when they were scrapped, we had the the salver literally blow towards those out, and we will restore those and put them on display around the campus. That's great. And the Invader. The Invader night aircraft, JD-1, as you see, it's in service from 44 to 72. Have the venerable Tomcat. This is one. This is a great example. We have two Tomcats on display in the main museum, one that is on a monument literally is the entrance to the museum and another one on display in hangar bay one so this is essentially an excess one that uh either another museum may take possession of we may restore it but we really really don't need three so it's just here in a holding pattern for now the c-130 that you see just on has a fascinating story it is the only c-130 to ever land aboard an aircraft carrier. Mm. And it did so on USS uh, Forrestal years ago, uh, flown by uh, Flatley, who was went on to be a, a two-star admiral. But this was a proof of concept to see if you could land a large transport plane on an aircraft carrier. And they generated enough wind over the deck that the airplane was able to successfully land and more importantly take off again. So how'd they get oh they did get it. They took it off then. Yeah. Okay. You bet. And and the C one thirty is known for its short takeoff and land capability. And with an aircraft carrier, yeah, it's a short runway, but you can generate a tremendous amount of wind over the deck that shortens the distance of both takeoff and landing. And then of course we're getting up to the flight line here. So you allow the public all the way up to yeah. this spot. As you look over here, in our, our, I'll call it the north tension membrane, it's off season now, but during season, and that season is March to November, that is our concessions area. Patrons can come rent chairs, and there's a rope line manned by our really, really talented volunteers. We have a narrator that's every bit as good or better, with all apologies to, to feed, uh, the, the Blue Angel 7, because they've been doing it for years and they'll narrate the shows to our audience. And the fun thing about a Blue Angel practice, it's a practice. 
They may go out there with six airplanes. They may show up with five. The boss may not be happy with the maneuver. He'll go do it again. And you just never know what mm. you're going to see out there. A lot of times they're flying some of the two-seat airplanes. You'll see them either in five or in four. It's, it's a great opportunity. And let's say you're visiting the museum from Des Moines, Iowa. You didn't know about this blues thing. You see people wandering out to the flight and you go, let's go check that out. Yeah. And boom, you've got your own private little air show. So, Captain, how do people get to come here and experience this? Well, we have the Blue Angel practice schedule on our website. So, folks that are coming here can look. Typically, it's every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1030 local uh, is when they take off. We open our gates about an hour prior. It's not every Tuesday. and Sometimes the Blues are on an extended trip. But if you just go to our website, NavalAviationMuseum.com, and uh, you'll you'll be able to, to get that. All right, cool, and it's open to the public, which is great. Yeah. So we're gonna come back in a little bit and check out the tent where people can come and do that. Well, let's walk on, see some of these other aircraft. That This is the Neptune. I don't know anything about this aircraft. It, it, it's a, it was a shore-based anti-submarine patrol aircraft, essentially used to hunt submarines and other surface aircraft. So again, a maritime surveillance aircraft. Okay. So when people come, I see we got grandstands here. We have and everything bleachers. Right on the flight line. You're able to rent chairs. You're able to get concessions, Chick-fil-A sandwiches, water, earplugs. Uh, we have volunteers that have been doing this for such a long time. Our narrator is every bit as good as Blue Angel Number Seven. It's it's a wonderful experience. Great. So while we're walking around to the next group of planes here, what? Uh, What's on the schedule of what's coming in for other aircraft? Is there anything on the horizon? Well, the, the really neat thing about this museum is the history of naval aviation, which, as I mentioned, started in 1911. We've got a wonderful 112-year run going, but the history of naval aviation is not static. We continue to add airplanes into our inventory, Super Hornets, Joint Strike Fighter. There's a whole new realm of unmanned aircraft, and as those airplanes become available, we want to bring them to the museum so we continue to tell the modern day story of naval aviation. So can we stop for a second? These sure. Are, these are the t new T-6s, right? They're T-6s. Uh, they're flown by Training Wing 6 and they're, they are teaching prospective naval, naval flight officers who will ultimately become weapon systems officers in Super Hornets okay. and other airplanes. And those are the PT-6As? Uh, yeah, I believe they're the A's. Okay. Awesome. So, Coast Guard? Coast Guard is obviously part of the Navy. That's a flying boat. Uh, no longer in service, but uh, it was very useful in its day as they did the very vital Coast Guard mission. Countless rescues, I'm sure. AJ-2, I don't know that point. The Savage is one of our uh, one of our vintage airplanes. Again, a um, I believe it's a shore-based airplane. I don't see the tail hook on it. So, and this airplane beside it is actually a trainer aircraft. It's called the TC4 Tic4. If that nose looks familiar, that is the nose to an A6E uh, intruder, and you can see the oh, tram yeah. FLIR turret underneath. That airplane was used to train the bombardier navigators, the BNs that flew the A6s. Uh, you'd have three students in the back, three possibly more, that were running some of the consoles, and they would actually learn how to do the really, really tough job of terrain following radar. So they could do low altitude, all weather, day, night uh, attack, utilizing those radars. Okay. Then after the DC-3, the we venerable DC-3. And then uh, one of the most distinctive carrier-based airplanes is the uh, Vigilante. The uh, Vigi was a supersonic attack aircraft. Really, really just totally sleek looking airplane. Yeah, it's really unique. I don't think I've ever seen one. Yeah. And then here on our right, we have uh, an A4 Skyhawk. Um, for many, many years until it was replaced by the T-45 Goshawk. That was the advanced trainer. That's the airplane that 
that I flew in flight school for advanced training. I carrier qualified uh, in that jet before I ended up getting my wings of gold. As you can see, that's a trainer and it's orange and white. The A4 was a wonderful airplane to fly and it's still flown by other countries to this day. You literally strap the airplane on. Um, it was tight and really, really nimble aircraft. You see this RF4 here, that was a marine RF4, uh, the photo reconnaissance uh, bird version of the F4. Right. Is it now you guys have one in the museum, right? We have an F4 in the museum, the RF4 here, and you can see the photo electronics oh, there. The blue angels there? No. Yeah. What's that? That's a T45 Gosshawk. That's what replaced the A4, and that's the advanced trainer. VT86 is flying those um for to again to train those advanced naval flight officers under training okay. and then you have those airplanes are also flown for the pilot training at naval air station meridian in mississippi and naval air station uh kingsville okay. down in south texas so when you guys think you're going to be getting the t7s I, I don't, we'll have to talk to our friends in the pentagon to see <laughs> how that how that goes and then here on your left you see an array of uh the EA-3 Sky Warrior, that was an electronic uh, attack version of the venerable A-3. And then we have... Refueling pod on there, right? Uh, yeah, it is, so it could do in-flight refueling. That's a carrier-based airplane, and it was... As I first came into the Navy, that airplane was still flying, and it, it would make your heart go pitter-patter as that airplane came in to land. Uh, C-1 Trader was a carrier onboard delivery aircraft. That's how we would get personnel and mail aboard. Uh, it would carry a number of passengers and or cargo. So what we, years are these? They're piston engines or radial engines? Yeah, there. you can see from 52 to uh, 88, 88. So we had 36 uh, years of service out of that. That was eventually replaced by the C2 Greyhound, which is just recently being phased out in favor of the, uh, t uh, uh, the tilt rotor. Oh, so, yeah. okay. Yeah. So these were all piston and, or rotary? They, they are. Rotary. They Radio are, engine. and the S2 Tracker is the anti-submarine uh, version of that same airframe. It was mechanized for uh, carrier-based anti-submarine warfare. And then the E1B Tracker, again, sim same airframe, was an electronic. That's the forerunner to the E2C Hawkeye. That looks like it shouldn't be able to fly. Uh, it, <laughs> it, it does seem to defy the uh, laws of aerodynamics. I completely agree. <laughs> no. Big hanger here that we're going to get to on another show here, but uh, I mean, this is where all the restorations are done. It right? is. Um, this is our restoration hangar. We own the western two thirds of it. Uh, Pensacola used to be a Naval Aviation Depot maintenance site. That was uh, went away due to one of the base realignment and closure commissions, but we inherited a wonderful stash of physical plant, lays, paint uh, paint booths, drill presses, band saws, sewing machines, everything you need to restore vintage aircraft. Hmm. And then uh, what do we have here? The, the airplane in the distance, uh, I forget the designation of it, but it was one of the early VIP transports and sync pack fleet would fly around uh, running the Pacific fleet from that uh, transport. And then you see uh, we've got in the distance our uh, PBY. That airplane is actually being dismantled and we'll find a home at Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum in, in Hawaii. And we're very, very excited uh, about that. Behind me you have the F3D uh, Skynipe, which was a nighttime fighter it was one of the early radars for night air-to-air -air interdiction. So I was going to ask you why I was painted black, but now I guess we know why. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people ask me why I have a C9 here. The Navy flew those for transport for many, many years. That C9 came to us because it was the first C9 to land in New York City post 9-11. And then now you're starting to see kind of the back end of our world here, um, the 
A3 is being dismantled. We just did not have room for it, so we've decided instead of spending the resources to maintain it, uh, we've given it back to the Navy and they're in the process of scrapping it. The one airplane we do look forward to getting on display in the distance, you see the P3 Orion 776 is the uh, side number. That was one of the last deploying P3 Orions and it was flight delivered to us in 2019 from a squadron at Whidbey Island, uh, Washington State, NES Whidbey Island. Right. And of course, you can see the tail on it, so you know it's yeah, the P3. Yeah, the mad boom, yes. And those are the, uh, the Allison turbines in there. Yeah, it's a beast airplane, and it's done a lot of great work. Still still flying a little bit, but that's slowly being phased out for the P-8 Poseidon, which does the same mission, however, in a 737 uh, airframe. Okay. And then, of course, we have DC-3. Um, yeah. you, you have one inside, too, right? We uh, No, we don't. No? this. I, actually, it's, a, it's a, what you see there is the airplane that landed at the uh, South Pole, K Sera Sera. Wow. Then we have some of the helicopters down there. Yeah. Um, so I want to take people over. I want to get inside the, the viewing area, the tent. You know, nobody's here today. I want to kind of give them a little bit of insight. You bet, I'd love it. It's somewhere. one of the great features of this museum that we get to host somewhere between 35 and 45 Blue Angel Air Show practices here. And it, it's a nice experience, and we're working very hard to make that experience for our patron the absolute best. So underneath the tent we're about to see is our concessions area. You can rent chairs, you can buy water, you can buy Chick-fil-A sandwiches. Uh, it's just a great experience. We even have our gift store out here, so you can come away with memorabilia to mark the occasion of watching your very own Blue Angel Air Show practice. And as I mentioned before, the practices can be kind of fun uh, because they, uh, they, they're they always different. It's, it's training. If you think about the Blue Angels, they go to their show sites on either late Wednesday or Thursday. They'll do their circles and arrivals. They'll fly a, a show on Friday, a show on Saturday, a show on Sunday, and if they're east of the of the Rockies, they'll typically fly back to Pensacola on Sunday evening, smoke the beach, fly down Main Street, Palafox, um, and then Monday's the day off, okay. administrative day, and then Tuesday they practice, Wednesday they practice, and one of the neat features about Wednesday is after they're done here, they'll typically come inside uh, the museum and sign autographs in the appropriately named Blue Angel Atrium. Mm -hmm. So. That's great, but out here, they get a chance to see the blues up close and personal with uh, the folks that come visit the museum. Okay, and when do they start up again? When's the season start? So their season, yeah, I'm gonna go from the end of season, which is coincident with the Naval Air Station Pensacola end of season air show. And that's our open house for the base. It's the blues last show of the year. It's a homecoming for them, which is a great experience. And then they, they'll do some turnover with the teams. They'll start training. They'll start with two airplanes, add a third, add a fourth. The solos will start out like this and then get like this. And then right after New Year's, the entire team will go to El Centro, California in the Imperial Valley and start their winter training. And they'll spend three months of intensive flying two, three times a day, really fine tuning what the Navy Flight Demonstration Squadron is known for, precision flying. Uh, and that'll culminate in March and then they'll fly back here. And so from March to November, we'll end up um, having two air shows a week, two practices a week. Okay. We're walking just as you would out, you've seen our concession area and the patrons just come out here and take a seat. We're literally right at center point. Mm -hmm. So you can't get any closer to the show than we're gonna be. So why is this Hornet here? This is an airplane that the museum inherited uh, from the Navy when the Blues transitioned to the Super Hornet, which they're flying now. Um, they ended up having some excess F-18Cs this two-seat, we didn't have a seven in our collection, a two-seat version. So we needed a two-seat Hornet, which we didn't have. 
certainly wanted to get one with the blues and we decided to put it out here where the patrons who've just watched the blues can get a wonderful photo opportunity standing in front of their very own Navy flight demonstration number seven jet. And seven jets are the ones that typically go to the show. They end up being the spare at the show. The, the narrator and the events coordinator will fly out typically a day early, Wednesday, get to the show, maybe fly an influencer. And that airplane also serves as a spare on the road in case one of the airplanes has a, a maintenance issue. They'll literally jump in the seven jet and take it flying so they can complete the show. Okay, great. Well, Captain, this was awesome. Thanks for showing me all the stuff here. I'm definitely going to come back for one of the practices. Right. Just, right just go to our website and uh, we will end up, uh, you can find our schedule and it's a great experience. Smithsonian's nice. They don't have the Navy flight demonstration right. squadron flying twice a week. That's great. Thank, Thank you so you much for your time. Thank you for right. being here. It's an honor to host you. Thank you.